go. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, it's episode number four of the Pain Consultants USA podcast. Today, Dr. Bonner and I are going to be talking about the medical management of uh, lumbar herniated discs. Uh, this is to follow up on episode number two, where we really talked about the self-diagnosis and self-management of these conditions before even getting to a physician. Uh, this evening, we're going to talk about um, the steps once you've gotten to a physician uh, and treatment thereafter. Uh, how are you doing today, Dr. Bonner? Well, thank you. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. So, um, you know, last time we talked a lot about, um, you know, self-diagnosis, trying to find if you have a, a position of preference or uh, position that takes the pain out of your leg. Um, you know, uh, building on that, uh, a lot of the same principles apply for physical therapy uh, as far as you know, getting uh, patients into a therapist for um, uh, McKenzie uh, based uh, treatment potentially. Um, and one of the things I always tell my patients is, or you know, one thing you always want to keep in mind McKenzie based treatment isn't purely extension based, it really is. You know, putting the body in a position of comfort. Right. Um, you want to elaborate yeah, a little think, bit on that? If you talk to a lot of these uh, physical therapists who have a lot of experience with it, you know, it might not just be laying on your stomach. Um, so just to kind of, we should review a little bit. I have my trusty model here again. And so the discs <laughs> are these kind of flexible segments that are in between the bones of the spine that are right in this area. And then the nerves kind of travel posterior. And this is the back of the spine over here. This is kind of the front of the spine or the anterior part, as we would say. So uh, when, the pa when a patient is laying on their stomach, the spine is kind of in this position. And I'm trying to, there we go. So, and if, again, if you're listening, we suggest you go look at the YouTube video so we can kind of see the model of the spine and see what it looks like. So in this position, you can imagine that maybe even gravity and the position of the spine helps pull the disc material where it's herniated up in this area back down into the center of the disc and then sometimes relieves that uh, pain that you get from compression of the nerve or just from the disc being torn in the more posterior part of the spine there. Um, and so uh, usually that's why we talk about the laying on your stomach, uh, feeling better, or even arching your back a little bit in that position. But sometimes it needs a little bit of variation. A lot of these therapists are very experienced at trying to work through those variations. So it might be laying on your stomach with a little side bend to one side or the other. Um, and so they can kind of work through a, a comprehensive evaluation of the different positions and figure out really which one works best for the patient. And, um, and you know whichever one works best that's the one the patient should use so the ones we talked about most commonly was that kind of stomach lying position but whatever the an experienced physical therapist finds for you is really uh, what will be uh, the best thing that works for you so and usually a lot of times if you get to this point and you've heard what we've told you to try already then maybe you do need a little bit more of an experienced evaluator kind of seeing what works for you uh, so um, that's kind of what we talk about with a directional preference. Um, go ahead. Yeah. And I know one of, one of the big things or selling points I have, uh, when I'm treating patients with lumbar herniated discs is, um, you know, when we talk about physical therapy for patients, I'm sure you hear it too. You know, sometimes it's a time commitment, right? And unfortunately with, uh, insurance co-pays, I mean, it's not cheap anymore for a lot of patients to be able to go to therapy. So, when we're treating these herniated discs with pain going down the leg, oftentimes with McKenzie-based therapies, um, you, know, you, you don't necessarily have to go two to three times a week, right? Um, once the, the uh, uh, therapist finds a directional preference, they can give you exercises to do at home um, for a week or two as long as things are improving and then see you back. So it's another kind of perk to this um uh, type of therapy. Yeah, I think there's um, actually uh, over than what you studied that and found that if we could find a directional preference, the amount of physical therapy visits required to make the patient improve were significantly less 
and also in general the patients improved much more so if you have a back problem and some uh, physician or physical therapist is able to help you find a directional preference it's a good prognostic sign that you'll be able to get better too on top of everything else yeah, I completely agree with that. And we see that on a daily basis. You know, one of the other things to mention before we move on is um, in addition to the uh, directional preference, right? Um, we always talk about an active based physical therapy program rather than a passive based. And, uh, you know, um, as, as it sounds, passive, you know, that's primarily modality. So you're just laying there and a therapist or a therapy assistant is doing something to you, whether it be uh, e-stim, ultrasound, hot packs, cold packs, uh, some, excuse me, some massage um, versus an active based where you're doing the work and you're really, you know, um, uh, exercising, you know, doing certain things. And yeah, can you talk on what the studies have shown with that? Yeah, we just, yeah, those alone don't really seem to have like a great effect. You know, uh, you're no more likely to get better than if you just really don't do anything. So you might feel good in the moment. It might be useful in the moment, um, but it tends to be just temporary relief related to most of those things. And I think overall, generally with therapy, we find that a comprehensive approach is really the best. So those things are fine to help calm down the patient and can be very useful when the pain is very acute. Uh, but we need to also take steps with the active program like you talked about um, to to make sure that we can get a long-term improvement. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention about that is also with physical therapy, we need to uh, we need to talk about modifying your activities of daily living so that we don't make the problem come back. So we do want to make the problem get better. But after we get it better, we need to make sure it doesn't just come back all of a sudden again. So we need to modify the way that maybe we lift our child off the ground or uh, wash the dishes or things like that. And that can be very important for a lot of these back problems because usually a lot of the patients will say those are the things that aggravate the back and it's because you're doing it kind of slightly inappropriately and you just need some direction on how to do it so i think that's the other thing that needs to be included is not only we're treating the current issue then we're trying to prevent the issue and also prevent other issues teach you how to do it the right way so that you don't get other issues a hundred percent and along those lines again patience right these injuries they take a while to improve. This isn't one to two to three months. Sometimes this is on the order of three to six months, sometimes a little longer. So if you can have the patients put in the work, be smart, you're going to see uh, the benefits. Definitely. Um, you know, uh, usually after patients have seen uh, a physician or gone to physical therapy, um, you know, oftentimes uh, thereafter, that's when insurance will give approval for an MRI. Um, so most of the time, you know, we're treating some of these things before an MRI is even obtained. And that's why, uh, in my opinion, uh, getting an accurate diagnosis by a skilled spine uh, provider is important from the beginning where you can waste 12 to 20 sessions on physical therapy, treating a hip issue uh, when it's really your back. Uh, so then therapy didn't do anything. Well, they didn't really treat yeah. you appropriately. So, you know, once we have an MRI, you know, I know we're in the same uh, belief that, you know, the MRI is to answer a question that we already have, right? We shouldn't rely on the MRI for the diagnosis. We should be getting the MRI to confirm our diagnosis. Um, if, uh, if we rely on the former, oftentimes we're going to get pushed down or led down a path that, um, you know, can be confusing, can lead to unnecessary tests, procedures, and possibly even surgery. So again, so one thing to mention there, I think for patients is what are the difference between some of the tests that you might get ordered for this problem? So uh, some people might have an x-ray. Well, what does the x-ray show us? Well, if we look at an x-ray, I'm going to bring this model back in for people watching the video. We see mostly uh, 
very dense tissues. So the bone is extremely dense. So we see bone very well on x-rays. We do not see the discs. The discs actually come up as basically clear substances on the x-rays. We do not see the nerves or the nerve roots. So we don't see any of that on an x-ray. We just see you know, the alignment of the bones, if there was an obvious fracture in the bones. Um, and, and there can, of course, be other things. But generally, for, for a disc herniation, we don't see anything too important. So an x-ray doesn't tell us that much in the case of a suspected disc herniation. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent, especially these acute discs, right? I mean, the the height of the discs, you know, the space between the bones you see on x-ray could look or appear yeah. pretty normal, even though they have yeah. a, a, a good yeah. disc herniation. So then if so. we go... Some people might get a CAT scan. So what do you see on a CAT scan? Well, CAT scan is just like getting uh, thousands and thousands of x-rays at the same time and then putting them all together into kind of a 3D picture. And so you do, you see, again, see the bones very well. You do see the soft tissue quite a bit better than an x-ray, but it's still not as good as when we get an MRI. And in an MRI, we really see the soft tissues, the nerves, the spinal canal, the discs, um, we see all that very clearly on an MRI. And so it's the MRI is really the best test to, to confirm what we're suspecting in the case of a lumbar disc herniation. We can see uh, tears in the discs. We can see uh, disc, parts of the disc that are sticking out from where they're supposed to be. And we can see um, if that disc may perhaps be pushing on a nerve and giving pain radiating down the leg. Um, so often an MRI is the most useful test in a patient with lumbar disc herniation for us. Um, now, if we go into medications, um, you know, another, uh, potential treatment arm for a herniated disc is medications. Obviously one of the most common is probably over the counter, uh, anti-inflammatories, um, Another, another very common one is the use of prednisone. We'll see a lot of patients who get prednisone acutely when the pain first comes on. Majority of patients I see with prednisone, whether I'm treating them or I see them after they've already tried it, usually feel decent while they're on it. Majority of the times, once they come off of it or are titrated down to a lower dose, usually the benefit's gone. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's a very small portion of patients who respond very well and then really maintain the relief, but it's, it seems to be a small portion. Sometimes um, I will kind of repeat a prednisone taper or a steroid if they get like, you know, a couple weeks beyond the end of the taper relief or a month of relief and then the pain kind of, kind of comes back. Um, but uh, I think generally, you know, what you're saying is probably true. It may be different for different types of, um, you know, if, it, if, it's, if it's a disc herniation causing pain down the leg versus, you know, more of a bony problem causing pain down the leg. But uh, I think that's really hard for us to say. So, uh, yeah, generally probably temporary relief, um, which is important still. We don't want to, like, we don't want to minimize the importance of how bad this pain can be and how good it feels for people to get some temporary relief. Yeah, I think exactly. I use it for a lot of patients where, you know, usually herniated disc or something bad happens at yeah. the worst time, right? So here a lot of times people are going away on vacation and yeah. it happens a yeah. week before, a few days before. Right. I mean, you know, even just to be able to enjoy yeah. things, you know, give a taper. Now I'm curious, what, what's your typical taper or what dose do you feel, uh, you need to start at with prednisone? Everybody's different on this. Um, so, so the strongest one that I'll give is, um, is 20 milligrams three times a day for four days and then decrease it down to twice a day for four days and then once a day for four days and then stop. Um, I was always kind of taught in 
I think internship where we did a lot of, you did a lot of steroid tapers for people with COPD exacerbations and things. They said, you don't really shut down the adrenal glands. If you stay less than two weeks, you know, the adrenal glands cover, recover pretty well, but if it's more than that, then they may have a hard time recovering. Um, but I'm sure there's different thoughts out there about that. I mean, I know that we think we can get some effect even with just like an epidural steroid injection. So, but I think that I always try to keep it less than two weeks and then I try to adjust the dose based on, you know, who the patient is and what other co comorbidities they may have if they're diabetic or something like that. Um, but that's the highest one I'll give. Yeah. What gotcha. about you? Yeah. Take it into account. Uh, I normally will do a five day course of 50 milligrams once daily for five days. And I just okay. stop, you know, again, going along lines, you don't need to taper a short yeah. course like that. Um, every so often I'll do a longer taper, but you know, that's in my opinion or my practice, if, if they haven't responded to that, you yeah. know, I'm not too sure they're going to respond to a longer longer course you know usually we'll see patients who have received a much lower dose of, of steroid yeah before a lot of people get like so, five milligrams for a day for five days and yeah um, and then i give them a taper and they feel better and then it comes back and they say well can't i just keep taking that and you really can't <laughs> keep taking that it's not a great idea wish um you know, I live in Miami and Miami is known for like a lack of rules and laws. And I had a patient who was an 80 year old woman who bought prednisone from someone else, like on the street, like where she lived because it made her feel so good. So she took 10 milligrams of prednisone every day that she bought illegally on the street, which is like... <laughs> Uh, it was crazy. I, I was like, are you sure you know what the risks are of doing this? And she was like, yes, but I can't live without it. So she took it every day and that's what she did. Did, did you happen to do a urine drug screen to see if it really was not, prednisone? No, I did not. That's, that's a good point. She was pretty adamant about it. I mean, this she had a different, a different problem, um, but it wasn't far off a lumbar disc herniation. It was probably more spinal stenosis, and she felt really good with prednisone, and she was determined to take it. And um, <laughs> I think I had actually offered her, you know, narcotic pain medication, and she was like, no, I can't. I don't take that. I can't tolerate it. I need prednisone. So... Uh, but I don't prescribe yeah. long-term prednisone, you know, um, I told her to see a rheumatologist to see maybe if she could qualify for that, if she had some inflammatory condition for that. But, um, that was just kind of a funny story because you don't, you don't see that anywhere else, except sometimes in Miami, you see funny stuff. <laughs> yeah. I haven't heard of prednisone yeah, off yeah, the street. It's not the usual thing you hear about <laughs> on the street. So, um, um, Oh, a couple other medicines that we should talk about are, uh, you know, you, you mentioned opioids, right? So we have to talk about them, right? They're uh, a pain reliever um, that oftentimes work best for acute pain rather than chronic. With the caveat, they don't really work that well for nerve pain. Um, I can't tell you the number of patients I see on a daily basis who they come in and um, uh, possibly their family physician or even surgeon gave them uh, Percocet or Vicodin for this acute leg pain. And they all say the same thing. I'm taking it, but it really doesn't do that much. Um, and it just highlights that that class of medication. So opioids are not that good for acute nerve pain. So in my opinion, um, if I have somebody with a disc herniation, no. I don't even consider opioids. I, I don't know what your thought yeah, is on that. Yeah, I mean, that. I definitely, I always try other medications first. So, um, you know, I definitely don't go there until everything else fails. Usually if I have like an acute disc herniation for a patient, you know, I try to uh, get them started on uh, other classes of medications and have them come back within a week to see how they're doing so that I can get be on top of, okay, these aren't working. Let's try something else uh, instead of 
you know, if you wait too long for follow-up, sometimes I think you'll lose the patient because it just hurts too bad. So again, we can't minimize this hurts really bad sometimes. So, um, so I try to see them within a week to see how, uh, see how it's going and then try to adjust things as needed, increase doses or change to other medications if they're not being tolerated. Yeah, and those medications that you're alluding to, I, I'm assuming you're talking about gabapentin or pregabalin yeah. or duloxetine. Yeah, um, usually I start with, um, you know, I think generally most people it's safe for them to try Tylenol. So does that help or not in this case? Well, I don't really know, but I think it's safe to try for most people. A lot of people, it's generally safe to try some type of anti-inflammatory, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, be, commonly being like ibuprofen. Uh, so, you know, or a lot of people have tried that when they come in already and may say, oh, yeah, that one really works for me. And so you can kind of increase the dose or stick with what works. Um, so that's that's one class. You know, uh, I think we should say acetaminophen really it's not, it's different than ibuprofen and anti-inflammatories. So, uh, acetaminophen being Tylenol works, uh, a little bit differently. So you can take those in combination a lot of times. Um, and then go to what you're talking about, gabapentin, pregabalin. Those are typically termed the neuropathic medications. So I try to give one neuropathic pain medication. I usually start with gabapentin. Um, and then, uh, I usually try to give them a, uh, a type of muscle relaxer. So try to get medications from different classes to work together. Usually I'll give two or three different medications. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I think it comes to, to the patient you're working on. Um, you know, some of our older patients, uh, Definitely won't be able to tolerate all of those possibly, but, but yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, the muscle relaxer, um, I tell patients up front, you know, if you're having a lot of back pain or spasms associated with this, well, there you go. That might help with that. But if you're, it's primarily leg pain, um, I'll usually go with gabapentin. Um, you know, if it's worse at the end of the day or nighttime, maybe we'll just focus on nighttime dosing where we could use a little bit more and not worry so much about the side effect of being tired. Um, you know, that gabapentin is a very common medicine. So if that as well as pregabalin has been used in the past for some different reason and they didn't tolerate it, um, nighttime, I, I like to use the, like, uh, nortriptyline. Uh, I use that a lot. Uh, so in the old class of, uh, antidepressants to actually, uh, help with nerve pain as well. So I'll use that. Um, uh, if they're having daytime symptoms, uh, and so we'll try gabapentin. And if they can't tolerate that, sometimes I'll, I'll use some Balta instead for yeah. daytime. And I always go back to or, uh, telling the patient, you know, if they have a directional preference, like we previously talked about, that's really the best pill is if you're having pain, get to that. Yeah position that makes you feel better because that's going to work better than any pill that you take and get to it frequently, you know, once per hour for a, a minute to five minutes, you know, just get to that position. Cause that'll work way better than any medication that we can prescribe probably. Yeah. And, and if we want to be honest and we look at the studies with regards to these non opioid medications, right? Right. A lot of them, they've gotten approved based on statistically significant decreases in pain, right? right? So, you know, you're looking at the uh, zero to ten pain score, well, they decrease pain by a two, right. right? So if it's at a six, it goes down to four. But sometimes you wonder, you know, is that clinically significant, right? Does that can the patient really tell the difference between a two or one point seven five? percent decrease on the what we call the VAS or the visual analog pain score from a zero to 10. So I completely agree. Movement uh, is the best yeah. medicine. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something we're going to agree on a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, we're following a, a typical kind of uh, treatment algorithm here. So in patients, um, 
sure. another test that patients might be uh, running into when they have this type of problem with pain down the leg or pain in the back is in, is the electromyography or EMG test. And um, I'm curious as to how often you may order that test when you think it's indicated in these types of patients. That's a good question because, um, you know, and there's no straightforward answer. I guess, you know, my, my rationale or thought process is, you know, if physical exam is consistent and MRI correlates with your suspicion, I mean, you have your answer there, right? So, um, now, Sometimes I will use an EMG and nerve conduction study in that setting if we're trying to figure out, well, how to best treat this. You know, so if if a patient is has seen a surgeon, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and they're recommending surgery, but the patient isn't necessarily um, keen on that, um, sometimes, and we're we're exploring more conservative care. We'll get the EMG, and if we don't see denervation uh, in the leg muscles that correlate with that nerve being pinched on MRI, uh, to me, I use that information as saying, okay, well, you know, there's there's not nerve injury leading to denervation of the muscle. Um, so you know what? Maybe we can treat this conservative a little bit longer, see if things improve. Not, I don't know if if you feel that's an appropriate way to use that test or not. That's a good point. That's kind of a finer point of the test, you know, but, um, but I think that's a good point if you don't, I mean, for, this is a kind of a complicated test. So for people who are getting an EMG, um, first off an EMG test should just be a supplement to a overall evaluation with a history and a physical examination. If it's done separately, it, it can it can be very misleading and misguiding. So, if someone's doing the test and they never even examined you, it's you know it's really hard to interpret that test and say it's a well done test. You know, number two, we always find we find lots of things on EMGs that we're not really looking for, and so the interpretation can be difficult. Sometimes we find we don't find anything when we're expecting to find things. And so how do we interpret that? Well, some of the finer points of the test is that there's different types of injuries to nerves. One injury is where parts of the nerve are destroyed, and that leads to changes in the test. But another type of injury is just kind of where uh, the nerve kind of temporarily stops working, but it's not destroyed. And so uh, the maybe you have pain and maybe you have weakness or numbness, but the test may not show as well the findings. And so sometimes it's hard to understand the different types of interpretations. Uh, and some clinicians don't understand the finer points. Some primary care physicians may order the test, may get it back totally normal, and the patient's still complaining and may, may not be able to understand why that's possible. So I think that you know it's very important that the test be used for a specific reason say for prognosis like you, like you're using it, say, uh, to determine, uh, if it fits, if, if the, if the nerve injury fits the diagnosis that you're looking for, or if there's some type of neurologic dysfunction that's not fitting with, uh, kind of a typical picture. I think that's kind of, you know, I think those are the times when it seems to be most important. A lot of times we can make the diagnosis without doing the test, but, um, it can be confirmatory and just kind of be another uh, backing point for your diagnosis. But it needs it needs to be interpreted cautiously. It needs to be done very appropriately and correctly to make sure it's done right and to make sure the results are interpreted correctly because you can get all kinds of results. So if you're a patient who's having an EMG done, you want someone who's very experienced, you want someone who's very thorough, and um, uh, it's not uncommon that I have to send patients to get a second EMG because they've seen had one before they saw me, and you know the data that I see is just not it's not good data, and you just can't really interpret anything from it. 
Yeah, a couple things to add there. I completely agree. It's very user dependent. So you want somebody that uh, has an interest in EMGs. They're uh, board certified and they enjoy doing them. They do lots of them. And, it, and again, they use this as an extension of their physical exam. We always go back to physical exam in history when dealing with musculoskeletal complaints is uh, the priority and, and should trump everything else. Um, you know, I think there was a study out of the University of Pennsylvania that even showed, okay, for people with suspected herniated disc in the low back causing pain going down the leg, you need to check so many muscles, right? So an EMG and a nerve conduction test is a two-part test. The first um, part for people who haven't had one is little electrical shocks, you know, in the leg or the arm, depending on what area um, we're working. And we measure how fast the signals get there, how big the response is, how fast it takes for the nerve to sense the little shock that we deliver. The second part of the test is where we take a little pin and put it into different muscles. We have you contract and the 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 waveforms we get on the screen as well as the sound we hear because right muscles are electrical electrically active um uh, so the second part with the needle the studies show that you know i, I believe it was you had to check at least six muscles it was if yep. you included the pair if you included the pair spinals in that to have a, a high um a very high accurate their accuracy uh, to diagnosing it. So to go along your lines, you know, you might get this uh, EMG results from an outside place, and they have uh, they've checked two or three muscles. Well, you know, that's not an appropriate study. There's a there's a high chance that something right. was missed. So uh, yeah, I would completely agree with that. Some diagnostic centers where patients get x-rays or MRIs or CAT scans, they've also gone into kind of doing EMGs and uh, just the the quality, the study that I've seen from some of these places is extremely poor because what they're having done is a technician does uh, the nerve conduction, conduction testing and then if there is an EMG, maybe a physician does do that, but sometimes they don't even do an EMG part. Um, and so you're just getting a nerve conduction test done by a technician who ha does not examine the patient because they're not probably qualified to do so. You get a physician reading the data who never saw the patient and never examined or spoke to the patient. And honestly, you know, you don't even really need to read the data because the a lot of the computer systems just read it for you anyway if you're just doing that if you're not going to see the patient then you can just let the computer read the data because you're not going to be able to come up with anything different so um so it, patients need to be careful about where they're getting a test like that done you want like you said someone certified and someone who likes doing it well and let's expand on that a little bit because in each state is different with regards to the laws of who can perform uh, nerve conduction and electrode and EMG. Um, but I know in Pennsylvania, there's uh, EMGs can be done by physical therapists and I believe even chiropractors. Um, now again, they're, they're very skilled in what they do. EMGs is not one of those things. Um, this goes back to our last podcast where you really have to know who's treating you. So if you're being referred um, for an EMG by your family doctor or, or someone else, or you just found somebody that does them, and they're not a uh, board certified physician uh, who's done extensive uh, training in neuromuscular uh, conditions, a diagnosis and treatment of such, uh, that person uh, should not be doing your EMG. Um, I see far too many um, uh, cookie cutter reports. There's, um, I can't tell you how many overdiagnosed conditions, especially rare conditions you'll see, um, uh, coming out of some of these places. And, and it's one of the reasons why Medicare and the government really cracked down on, um, you know, EMGs at one point were being abused with how frequent they're being done. Um, so what the government's kind of idea and we're going off on a side tangent but their idea of 
of fixing that issue is cutting reimbursement to decrease the uh, interest in people right. performing them. Where what they really should have did was they should have cracked down on right. who right. can perform them. They didn't do that. I mean, this is again, you know, it's when you have politicians yeah. making medical decisions. I'm that's a good to topic. Go back to when we were, uh, just one more thing about that. When we were in residency, I mean, what what is the most? What are the three most common? issues when you're doing an emg the it's all the same thing it's technical error we used to say you know if something <laughs> if, a, if a signal wasn't coming out right we were probably doing something wrong and then we could we had to think about okay which type of technical error is this and then we had to fix it and then you could get the right signal so if you're not skilled in doing this this test and you don't know how to fix the you know all the problems that can happen with the machine and everything and I, and identify where the nerves are, you know, it's not going to come out. Right. So we can, we, I'm sure we could do a whole podcast about EMGs at some point, but, um, if you're getting one, it needs to be done by someone experienced. It needs to be some done by someone who has evaluated you so that they know what they're looking for on the test. Yeah, completely agree. And I almost forgot talking about that, and that we that, that was good. Um, okay, so now uh, you know, following that um, uh, treatment algorithm, um, let's talk about uh, injections, right? So um, when Dr. Bonner and I mention injections for this, where you know we're talking about epidural injections. Um, a lot of patients will say, oh, I already had an injection. Well, what they really had was muscle or uh, steroid or uh, uh, anti-inflammatory type medication injected into a muscle in the area of right. the pain in the low back. So, so again, that's a nonspecific type injection, often called a trigger point. It's probably equivocal to taking prednisone by mouth. So you know, we're, we're going to talk about epidural injections. Um, uh, for these conditions. So you want to give a little overview of, I guess, the basics of and where the epidural space is and yeah, we've looked all at that on your here model. A bit. Um, so the nerves travel in a space. If we look at this view, I don't know if we can see that well, but that is kind of the canal at the top. And in that canal, is where the spinal cord to a certain level to about the L1 level travels and then the nerves come down off that and travel down through that canal and then they come out at each level and so we can see a nerve coming out uh, here 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 and so on and so uh, so we can actually inject medication right around these nerves if they're irritated and we can do that uh, with a couple of different approaches to the spine. Um, so if you're getting a, an epidural injection or a nerve block injection, you might have what's called a transferaminal epidural injection. And that would be an injection that's placed right in this space, which is called the foramen that surrounds the nerve. Or you could have an inner laminar epidural injection. That's one that's placed um, right there, uh, usually between what's called the lamina, uh, bony part of the posterior part of the spine and we put the needle right through the space to access the epidural space, which surrounds the nerves there. Um, and that, that's really the two main different ways that we, that we get to the, uh, to the nerve where we're trying to inject the medication. Um, so, uh, can you just show uh, on that model, do you have where the caudal yeah, injection sure. would be? Yeah, another way. Um, down through the bottom of the sacrum here. Um, so uh, right about here, there's a part called the sacral hiatus, and we can stick uh, a needle right up there. Um, there's nerves coming out of here. I'm not really sure they're supposed to be <laughs> where this is, but uh, we can put a needle right in this hole, and that actually connects all the way up here so we can inject a large volume of medication to try and stretch the medication up to where the, 
the nerve is pinched there. Um, and that's, that would be termed a caudal epidural. Um, I don't really do many of those because they're very much less targeted um, than a transforaminal or interlaminar injection. As you can see here, we're just injecting medication kind of and just hoping it spreads up to the area. If I know that you have a disc herniation right here, like this little red dot here, then I'm going to put the medication right in that area to see if I can get it to, to calm down as opposed to injecting it all the way down here to flow all the way up the spine there. So, and again, of course, uh, this is easier understood by looking at our video as opposed to just the podcast, but we think this is probably beneficial for you to, to check out if you're questioning having one of these procedures. And you can also, you know, there's a difference between putting the medication here and putting the medication back here. The medication may flow a bit differently. And so, um, you know, we, we can get more into this, but sometimes if a patient's had an interlaminar injection, but no relief, you know, maybe I will try a transforaminal injection to see if it will, if it possibly will work, because you never know that the medication could have spread differently um, than it would spread for the transforaminal, and maybe uh, the patient didn't get relief from that. That's a good overview, and I would agree. Um, if you are having a first-time epidural, Right. I guess we should back up. The epidural should always be performed under fluoroscopy or live x-ray to guide the, the, the needle, right? So uh, nobody should be performing blind epidurals anymore. Um, uh, but, yeah, first line would either be a transforaminal approach or an interlaminar approach. Um, you know, s some of the factors that um, might lead physicians to do one or the other is comfort level, right? So I'm Providers are just more comfortable doing the procedure one way or the other, whether that was the way they trained. Um, location of the disc herniation. Again, if the, and I'll try to show on my little model here, right? If the disc herniation is far outside the canal where the nerve exits its spine, like you said, makes sense to put medicine there. Um, Sometimes Just patients will have a disc herniation. A more in front of your face. Yep. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So disc herniation where it exits the spine, you put the medicine right next to it. Um, if the disc herniation is a little more in the center of the spine, but for one reason or the other, patients don't have a big opening here, right? They might have arthritis as well. So sometimes I will come in from the back um, with a lateral approach. So putting that needle f as far over uh, off to that one side as possible to get more medicine in there rather than most of it staying out here because the stenosis um, won't let us in. Uh, but yeah, I would agree. If a provider wants to perform a caudal epidural and you've had no injections before, to me that's a red flag um, that they possibly, you know, Possibly you should be seeing a different no. provider. Um, I will say I have done a few caudal epidurals with ultrasound guidance in the past. Uh, just in a few cases, a patient's insurance wouldn't cover uh, an, a fluoroscopy-guided uh, epidural injection. Um a patient who was in severe pain and came to the office, uh, severe radicular pain down the leg and, uh, and couldn't, you know, couldn't, um, we weren't doing injections that day. And so, or we weren't doing fluoroscopy guided injections that day. So occasionally you mentioned, you know, these should be done with fluoroscopy. They really should be generally, but occasionally, you know, people used to do blind caudal epidurals very frequently. I think you can still do, a, you know, now you can do them with ultrasound very easily with, you know, a lot of confidence that you're in the epidural space. Um, but it's preferable to, you know, have that, the x-ray guidance, the fluoroscopy guidance. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not that I I don't do a caudal epidural no, no, no. Uh, every so often, but 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 usually first injection. But uh, other than those reasons, um, you know, one of the other potential reasons for a caudal um, would be if you're on blood thinners, yeah. right? Um, you know, when you do 
So again, model here. I do have a little little needle here. This is a TUI. This is a type of needle for the old school labor epidurals or the inner laminar approach, right? So anytime you put a needle through the back part of the spine in the center, again, you need to stop blood thinners um, per the recommended um, duration. Um, uh, caudal epidurals, you don't really have to do that. It's safe. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, what we do worry about is a, a, a bleeding in the spinal canal compressing the nerves. You don't have to worry about that in the in the, the sacral hiatus or the canal there. Um, you know, there has been a change with regards to um, epidurals via the transferaminal approach again. Um, there's papers that have come out over the last two years to actually um, say that it's safe to perform these injections while on your blood thinner. So again, you know, a lot of patients have multiple medical issues going on. Um, if you're on a blood thinner, you know, that's where you really do have to have a conversation with a spine provider who's skilled, who's done uh, many of these, uh, and they're up to date on the current literature to, to know what's safe yeah, and what's so, not i mean any any good provider who's taking care of you for one of these issues uh, should be able to uh you know know the differences between these procedures they should be able to probably perform most of these different procedures and um and be able to uh offer you them as different options for the possible treatment um, are you aware of any studies that show a difference in outcomes with one type of epidural versus another? That's a, that's a good one because most of these studies, I mean, you could find a study one way or the other to possibly support, you know, a small difference, whether it be a slight improvement versus maybe you require one less injection within a 12 month period. But, um, you know, my tendency is uh, I lean towards transferaminal approach first um, uh, to deliver the medication right around the nerve root and into the epidural space. I will perform interlaminars in those uh, situations that we talked about, but I'm not aware of a study to say with 100% certainty this is the best approach. And I think that's why both of these are still done. What, yeah, yeah. What's your thought? I feel exactly the same way. I think. It seems like most people tend to gravitate towards what they were taught. And um, um, I just, you know, if one doesn't work, I might try a different type. Or if one doesn't work, I might try a, a different steroid and see if that works. Uh, but I guess we should just go back to focus mainly that, um, you know, if you have a problem with pain, epidural injections are typically thought to be beneficial for leg pain especially when it's a disc herniation. So it, they don't help as much for back pain, but they help more for the leg pain. And, um, and so you should have an injection that's targeted near the level of where the disc is impinging on the nerve. Uh, so sometimes you might have, uh, you might have two levels targeted. Um, and, and that can be fine because, you know, sometimes the disc herniation in the, in the canal so the disc herniation might actually be more inside the canal, which I can't really show in this picture, but it might be more in the central part of the canal. And that can actually catch the nerve that comes at the level below. So sometimes you might have it, an injection that's at this level and at this level to kind of get medication to make sure it flows down and up from there. Um, but the medication tends to spread a little bit up and a little bit down when you inject it. So if you only have one level, you know, sometimes that can be fine too. Um, but uh, go ahead. You're going to say something. No, I mean, another, th you know, this is more to kind of things to throw up your kind of red flag that you might want to watch or double or second guess that provider is if you have a physician who's saying you need a three level epidural, so a transferaminal, but at three different spots at the same time, uh, to me, that's oftentimes a, a red flag as well to say, hey, you know, maybe I'm not in the right place. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that. 
I, a couple couple specific instances come to mind, and it's usually the same provider that's doing this type of yeah. procedure. So I guess um, along that lines, you know, um, right? So we always talk about how usually there's one cause of what's really causing the problem. So where's the pain coming from? Well, usually it's if it's pain going down the leg, it's nerve being pinched, and it's being pinched at kind of one specific level. So either right here in the foramen or more in the canal, but usually it's pinched kind of right in one specific place. Sometimes there's a double crush injury where it can be two different ones. But if you're doing three levels, to me, like you're saying, that says that either you're not sure, you're not really sure what's going on there, or you don't really care what's going on there. Um, you're, you're not really targeting anything. You're just kind of just doing an, I guess like a, a, a hydrogen bomb approach, like just blast everything and hope it gets better. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not targeted care. And so, um, I certainly might try two to three different levels. If one doesn't work, I might go up a level and say, maybe this one is where more of the symptoms are coming from. I, that that's a very rare occasion if I was ever to get to three different levels for the same patient for the same exact problem. So, but at yeah, different times, at different times is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely wouldn't, I've never done three at the same time. I've never, yeah. <laughs> and one of the, the other benefits of a transfer, if we're trying to figure out the exact cause, right? Because sometimes you do get the MRI and there are findings at a couple different levels. Um, the patient's young and if we're, we want to first help their pain, but if they are seeing a surgeon as well and they're contemplating surgery, a transferaminal approach when we, you know, normally we put two medicines that are, have any kind of uh, potential positive effect, a Novocaine or lidocaine-based medication and the steroid. Right. There's x-ray dye as well to make sure we're in the right place, but we're really looking to get the benefit from the steroid and the, and the, the anesthetic can also help. But if you feel really good right after the injection for the first few hours, you know, that can clue us in that we're at the right level as well. Right. I mean, do you use that sometimes? So more of like I a diagnostic to, approach? Yeah. I try to have a diagnostic approach to every injection that I do. So uh, I find it difficult sometimes because patients want to feel better after, right after they get a procedure or they say, oh, well, it's got to take a little time to set in. And so you're like, no, it really doesn't. If there's lidocaine, it should feel much better right away. But I try to take a diagnostic approach to pretty much every procedure I do and say beforehand, I want you to think about how it hurts right now. And I'm going to ask you how it feels, you know, right after we're done with this, you know, and if. Uh, and so I, I, and I always try to record that response. So I have an idea if, if, if you, right, like you said, if you target the right spot and you numb up that spot, then the patient should, um, should hopefully feel better at least immediately. And then for some period of time until that, that anesthetic wears off, of course, you know, something that we'll talk about over and over again is placebo effect. There are certainly some placebo effect where patients may feel better right away. Uh, but it's still, I think, useful to kind of record that response and uh, and keep that for the future uh, in case if the pain returns or it doesn't go away or something. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. What, do you quote uh, like percent relief for patients when you're talking about an epidural for like a, a disc herniation, like what, like to give them realistic expectations? Do you have a number? Um, for how much to give them as an expectation? Yeah, like how much relief to expect um, I think the, from the injection. I think the study that we always reference is um, kind of 60% relief for up to like two months is what the, I forget, I don't remember the exact study offhand, but I think that's, that's typically what um, my explanation is. My explanation is more, I don't really quote the percentage, I more say, this can help. It is very rare for it to take the pain away entirely. Um, mm -hmm. And then the pain is likely to return in the future. Uh, and usually that's kind of within two months. And if you get more than, you know, more than half relief and more than two months, then that's a great result. Um, because I always, 
Uh, although maybe you're not supposed to, I always try to temper expectations um, because a lot of patients think coming in that the injection is the cure all. And it's just not the case, as we know, doing these procedures all the time. You know, some people get better, some people don't. And it's, it's not easily predictable who's going to get better. Um, so um, I just kind of make sure to temper the expectations that this is not a cure-all. You're not guaranteed 100% relief. Some people do get better 100% and the pain never comes back. And that's great. But that's, that's kind of the, I think that's more the exception than the rule. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. And it, uh, like, like you said, it's hard to predict. Right? And I tell patients, yes, I mean, it is very hard to predict. Um, somebody has an acute disc that is, you know, not compressing the DRG, which is a dorsal ganglion, part of the, the, the nerve where it exits the spine. Um, you know, so if they have a directional preference and with the disc and we're doing an epidural, they're going to get better. The question is for how long? And um, what I tell patients is if we can't significantly improve your pain long term with one to two injections um, over the course of for the next three to six months, we don't, you know, we're not going to do more. Right. So the, the way to think about these injections is really, um, again, in conjunction with a comprehensive treatment plan. Like you said, this isn't the end all be all. Right. Uh, injections oftentimes are used to allow patients to to get through the severe pain to start therapy or if they've plateaued in therapy because uh, um, something to add to the treatment plan um, to see if we could break through that next barrier um, or even just to calm the pain down enough so they can do their home exercises um, to give time for natural healing yeah. to occur yeah i guess we haven't really mentioned that um we might have mentioned it last podcast but you know natural course of this is that it will get better over time and it can take a while up to two years but it will get better over time so uh, a lot of the things that we're doing they may have temporary uh effects and then your body will kind of take care of the problem itself over time body does a great job yeah. healing itself and i think the sport trial um which um, came out a few years ago and there's been follow-ups uh since you know really did highlight that over a two-year span no matter the treatment most patients get better um whether it's surgery pt injections um they do pretty close to the same you know now, again, depending how you analyze the data, and you know we won't get too far into that, but if you're analyzing the data as it should be, um, you know, I, I believe that you know outcomes are pretty yeah. similar. Which, so that brings us to the last treatment arm, and that is surgery, yeah. right? There are times where surgery is needed to remove the compression on the nerve. Um, it, you know, I, my philosophy is you want to try everything else beforehand because once you've committed to surgery, there's no going back. And you can go to the most skilled surgeon in the world, but, you know, when you're talking about a disc herniation, so a simple kind of, they go in and they remove the herniated disc, they don't really do anything else. You know, depending on the data, you're still looking at a 15% failure rate right? Or reherniation rate. Um, so, you know, once you have surgery, especially if you're young, you are pro highly likely you're going to require an additional surgery and subsequent surgery outcome rates drop. And then the more surgery you have, it's only a matter of time until the surgery is going to require hardware to be placed. And then all bets yeah. are off. Yeah, I mean, we're not surgeons, and we try to stop people from having to have surgery. So uh, I'm with you that we do everything we can to get them to not have surgery. Uh, 
I will, you know, what are red flag signs to get people to surgery sooner? So if you're listening to this and you might have a disc herniation, when would someone like us get you to surgery sooner? Well, if you're having severe weakness in some part of your leg that's related to the disc herniation, uh, that would be very concerning. If you're having uh, incontinence of your bowel or bladder where you lose control uh, of those areas, uh, you know, that would be concerning for something that's called cauda equina syndrome, where a lot of the nerves in your spinal canal are compressed. Um, if you're having a lot of difficulty walking, which would be related again to kind of weakness in the legs due to nerve compression, um, that would be very concerning. So uh, those are, uh, you know, a few of the things that we like to ask about. Uh, to make sure that the nerve compression isn't isn't too severe or even I shouldn't just say compression there's really a lot of uh, other inflammatory factors that can damage the nerves um, and so they they can cause problems as well uh, but a lot of times when you see the really severe cases there's really severe compression of the nerve roots um, and so we just like to make sure that that's not the case that's very rare um, but it can happen, and that's a, those are definitely times when we like to get patients to surgery sooner rather than later. Uh, without a doubt, I would just add the, you know, what we call saddle yeah. anesthesia, or where you can't, you lose feeling in the genitals uh, in that region of the body. That also can clue yeah. us in that the, a certain part of the spinal cord is being compressed. Those are emergent um, emergencies and you should see you should go to the local er contact your surgeon if you already have one um i, I, th I think one of the take-home uh, points with this whether we're treating with an injection whether we're treating with surgery um or medications you know it's it's not one treatment to correct everything this has to be done in unison with a comprehensive approach, again, based around movement. Um, and even after treatment is done, right? Movement, appropriate graded exercise, return to sport or activity is, is gonna be important to help prevent yeah, reoccurrence. Definitely. definitely. <sighs> I think that's pretty good. I think we did a, we covered a lot of the material. Um, you know, those are a lot of the things that we're thinking about. If you come on to see us with one of these problems with a lumbar disc herniation, uh, this is kind of the algorithm that we're working through as possible treatments for people. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a few other details here and there, which, you know, the lumbar disc herniation is so common. We'll probably talk about this a hundred more times, uh, in the next year on this podcast. So, um, if you, if you're having a problem with that, you know, feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Uh, we're, we're definitely happy to help and, and see if we can help you get better. Um, I don't know. Did you have anything else to add, Dr. Connor? I think that was pretty good. Um, yeah. I mean, we talked about a lot today. Um, you know, um, you could check out the podcast. Um, we will have a transcribed version of the podcast, uh, notes available in the future too. Uh, so if you want to go back and refer any to anything specific, you can do that. Uh, and if you're you listening know, to this for the, and you have questions or didn't see the, the video, uh, go check out the video on YouTube, which, uh, we, um, try to show a few models and show a few more details about the spine. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Well, great conversation. Uh, look forward yeah, to the next. We'll talk Have to a good soon. night, bud.